Hi there. Welcome back to Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology. This lecture will be focusing on stable and radiogenic isotopes and their uses of isotopic ratios to characterize igneous rocks. When we refer to an isotope, we are referring to an element that has the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons and therefore a different mass. Stable isotopes are not produced by radioactive decay and therefore they're going to last forever. Some common stable isotopes that are useful in igneous and metamorphic petrology are going to be oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, lead, and sulfur. The mass differences in these isotopes are less obvious than chemical differences. So when we're referring to a mass difference in terms of fractionation, it's always going to be very small. But some fractionation may occur during the reactions. Therefore, we can use these to help us identify what's happening in the rocks and how they're evolving over time. If mass fractionation takes place, the light isotope will concentrate in the lighter phase. So as so, an so example, it'll concentrate in vapor over water over the solid. The efficiency of mass fractionation, which we are going to call F times the mass difference over the total mass, is dependent upon the mass of the isotope that we're dealing with. So for example, lead 204 and lead 205, you won't see much of a fractionation effect. Whereas when we're talking about helium, helium 1 to 3 will fractionate appreciably. This is because the lighter the isotope or the greater the mass difference, the more of an effect that you'll have on the fractionation. Stable isotope studies are usually limited to sulfur and lighter isotopes, and they can give us a lot of different information on a lot of different things. But mainly they're going to be used for things like, such as equilibrium temperatures, source indicators, and a history of what process is involved in the evolution of the magma. Stable isotopes are really useful in assessing the relative contributions of different var and various reservoirs. Each they will have a unique and distinctive isotopic signature. Because of small changes in mass, the ratios of the isotope to isotope are going to be very small and we're going to have a very difficult time using them. Therefore, instead, we're going to use what's referred to as the delta notation, which relates the ratio of the sample to a standard and is expressed in the per mil or per million notation. The equation that we have on the screen here is going to be what we're going to use for this. Equation 910 basically just takes the ratio of the sample, subtracts it by the standard, for the case of oxygen, small, divided by the standard, and multiplied by 1,000. This is going to give us to a relatively easy to work with number. So when we're looking at the delta notation for things such as oxygen, we can use this to look at things like juvenile versus meteoric versus brine waters. We can look at the delta notation or the delta 18 oxygen value for mantle rocks, which will be different than surface reworked sediments. And we can help us to evaluate things such as contamination of mantle derived magmas from crustal sediments. The delta 18 O value is quite different for mantle rocks than it's going to be for surface rocks. And a typical value for a mantle source will be somewhere right around 5.7 to 6 in an igneous rock, whereas a surface rock can range from anything from negative values all the way up to values as high as 10, 20 to 30 per mil. Oxygen, because of this, is one of the most widely used stable isotopes in igneous and metamorphic petrology. Hydrogen, sulfur, and others are starting to become more useful, but oxygen has been the staple for stable isotope analyses of igneous rocks for a long time. When we normalize oxygen, we're going to normalize something that's referred to as SMO, or standard mean ocean water. This is going to be a standard reference water uh, that's used in all analyses and basically is now just going to be a value that we're going to normalize our, our ratios to. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're going to be normalizing to SMO, what is the delta value of SMO? Well, if we put this into our equation here, if we put the, the value of SMO, whatever the ratio is, regardless of it, into our uh, sample location, minus the same number, and divide it by that number, we're going to end up with a, with a zero. So the delta notation, delta 18 oxygen value of SMO is always going to be zero. In igneous rocks, there are two common types of usages for, for stable isotopes, magma source and contamination recognition, and then mass balancing of models. Also, thermal barometry of minerals is, is possible, but you have to be careful. 
there's a possibility of re-equilibration of that temperature and alteration. And since we're dealing with temperatures at such high, uh, high energies, sometimes these, these temperatures can be unreliable. Radioactive isotopes and radiogenic isotopes are isotopes that decay into or are produced from other elements most of these elements are going to have both a radioactive and a stable isotope associated with them. Radioactive elements, or what we're going to refer to as the parent, decays into a stable element or the daughter. These radioactive elements decay at a constant rate and therefore have many applications in igneous and metamorphic rocks. And since these elements are not affected by pressure, temperature, or composition, they are usually useful in modeling petrogenic processes and the sources of magmas. Radiogenic isotopes are evaluated in two ways, the parent to daughter ratio and the daughter to a stable isotope of the same element ratio. There are three ways isotopic variation occurs in rocks. The first is by mass fractionation, as we talked about for stable isotopes. This occurs in all isotopic systems, but is mostly going to be used in stable isotopes, and is really only effective for the light stable isotopes. The greater the mass difference, the greater the fractionation. This is really only useful at low temperatures, and therefore mass fractionation doesn't occur at igneous and metamorphic temperatures. Second is chemical variation. This is a result of changing chemical conditions and therefore changing radiogenic isotopic ratios. In magmatic systems, adding more of the daughter product isotope or the stable isotope from a system can change the isotope ratio accordingly. This allows for the distinction between different magmatic processes in the system. Finally, we have time. Time, in terms of radiogenic isotopes, can change the, the ratio with the, the according to time. This is a field that we're going to refer to as geochronology. For example, if we have potassium-40, which decays into argon-40, the greater the difference between the basalt and rhyolite will be if there's longer times between them. This is also the case when we have things such as a chemical fractionation where potassium is more abundant in one, one rock type than in others and therefore decays at different uh, time scales as, uh, in one rock compared to another. The longer the radioactive isotope is allowed to decay, the lower the parent to daughter ratio, or the higher the daughter to stable isotope ratio should be. So when we look at the potassium 40 to argon decay scheme, basalts to rhyolites by fractional crystallization, which is a chemical fractionation process, rhyolites are going to have more potassium than a basalt. So therefore there'll be there should be more potassium-40 to decay into argon-40 over time in the rhyolite than in basalt. And therefore, when we look at the ratio of argon-40, or the daughter product, versus argon-39, which is a stable isotope of argon, the ratios will be different for a basalt versus a rhyolite. Radioactive decay is a constant for each element and the law of radioactive decay, decay dictates this constant. How long it takes for an element to decay, one half of the volume to the, to the stable daughter product is called the half-life, and the amount of daughter product to parent product over time is related by equation 9.14. As long as we know the amount of daughter product and the amount of remaining parent product, we can calculate the time. So we want to note that our half-lives are going to be consistent and constant for each element. They're, they're changed between elements, but they're going to be consistent and not in, in constant between elements. And we're going to refer to this as the decay constant. Our first system we're going to look at for the radiogenic isotope systems is the potassium argon system. This is what we just discussed previously with potassium 40 decaying into either calcium 40 or argon 40. Calcium 40 is the most common but we can't distinguish between radiogenic calcium-40 from non-radiogenic calcium-40 since it's a stable isotope of calcium. Argon-40 is an inert gas which can be trapped in many solid phases as it's forming them. When a rock is hot, all the argon escapes, resetting the radiometric clock, and all the daughter product therefore will be removed. 
When a volcanic rock forms as a result of eruption, the clock is reset, and the argon-40 that accumulates after the rock is formed must be the daughter product from potassium-40. The temperatures in which this happens are referred to as blocking temperatures, and they're various for different minerals, but, it, but the instant cooling closes all the minerals in a similar time recording the age. As a result of this, the argon-argon-40, argon-argon geochronology technique grew from the discovery of being able to use potassium and argon to determine the dates. Normally, in a rock, argon-40 is zero because of the fact that argon is an inert gas and will diffuse out of the rock very easily. Thus, we can get an age from a single rock by measuring potassium-40 and argon-40 in it, both as unknowns. This is by far one of the most widely used applications of geochronology in, in igneous and metamorphic petrology. The strontium iridium or iridium strontium system uses the decay of, of iridium 87 into strontium 87 plus a beta particle. Rubidium will behave like potassium and go into things such as micas and alkali feldspar. Strontium behaves like calcium, so it'll go into things such as plagioclase and apatites. The strontium-87 daughter product is compared typically to the strontium-86 stable isotope. Strontium-87 is stable and non-radiogenic. Strontium and non-radiogenic strontium is present in nearly any rock. The amount of strontium-87 in any rock is equal to the original strontium-87 plus radiogenic strontium from decay of rubidium-87 over time. One of the primary ways this isotope system is used is to determine the sources of contamination of igneous rocks through time, though caution needs to be taken because strontium is very mobile and hydrothermal alteration can affect the ratio. When we look at things such as the mantle, rubidium is going to be a very incompatible element in the mantle versus strontium. So therefore, the, the mantle should have very little rubidium since it's going to concentrate in the liquid during partial melting whereas strontium is more stable and therefore will be concentrated in the mantle. This gives the mantle a strontium isotope ratios that are going to be less than 0 0.706. Crustal rocks, which will be enriched in rubidium due to the partial melting of the mantle and rubidium being incompatible and in going into the fluids, will be enriched in rubidium and depleted in strontium since strontium is more compatible in the mantle. Therefore, strontium isotope ratios will be greater than 0 0.706. Older crustal rocks will have higher strontium isotope ratios. Be due to the, due to the de decay of strontium-87 in, in crustal rocks over time. Thus, a rock cannot have an ambiguous age if you don't know the percent strontium-87 it is radiogenic. This can be somewhat problematic. Rubidium strontium was, was originally used for dating rocks. This is something that's referred to as the isochron technique. This requires three or more cogenic samples with a range in rubidium strontium concentrations. This removes the ambiguity of not knowing the percent of strontium-87 that's radiogenic. These rocks, these minerals, could be three cogenic rocks derived from a single source by partial melting, fractional crystallization, other processes, or three coexisting minerals with different potassium ratios in a single rock, or different strontium rubidium ratios in the same rock. The equation used to calculate the age of using rubidium strontium is similar to the equation for the potassium argon method that we applied previously. The half life of rubidium is 49.6 billion years. So this is method is really good at dating really old rocks. Three minerals with different rubidium and strontium contents are required for both 87 and 86 to be measured. As time goes on, each mineral strontium 87 and rubidium 87 ratio will change. Knowing the relationship between the three minerals, rubidium and strontium contents will allow for the calculation of the age. The Samarium neodymium system uses two rare earth elements that are both light rare earth elements that are both very incompatible in the mantle. 
therefore these elements will fractionate into the melt instead of staying in the solid. The samarium neodymium ratio is lower in partial melts than in the source, and also lower in late stage crystallizing liquids. The samarium neodymium system is more robust than the rubidium strontium isotope system because neodymium and samarium are non mobile. In this system, samarium is more compatible than the, in the mantle than the neodymium. Both neodymium and samarium, since they're both light rare earth elements, though, are going to be both very incompatible. Samarium 147 decays in the neodymium 143 by alpha decay, meaning that a helium particle is expelled. The half-life of the system is approximately 106 billion years. So while it can be used to dating rocks, it's not very common and mostly used only for minerals such as garnet and metamorphic petrology. Our final system is the uranium thorium lead system. This is a very, very complex system, even though it's one of the most widely used isotopic systems for dating igneous and metamorphic rocks. The complexity of the system requires a complete understanding of the system in order to properly use it. Uranium has three radioactive isotopes, uranium-234, 35, and 38. Lead has three radiogenic isotopes, lead-206, 207, and 208. Thorium has multiple radioactive and radiogenic isotopes, but the main ones that we're interested in are going to be thorium-232, 234, and 230. All of these elements are incompatible in the mantle and concentrate in the melts early. Therefore, they will be concentrated in the crust. Dating rocks with the uranium thorium lead system requires a mineral with a high thorium content and uranium content and a very low lead content, so that we can assume that any lead is the result of radioactive decay. Therefore, we're going to look at ratios of parent to daughter or daughter to parent ratios for two different uranium isotopes. If the age match, we're going to call this age concordant, meaning that simultaneous coevolution of lead 206 and lead 207. If they don't, they're considered to be discordant, meaning that one of the lead isotopes is off from where it should be. The example shows a 2.5 billion year old development of, an is of the isotopic system and is considered to be the Concordia diagram, or the Walther's Concordia diagram. The curved diagram shows the evolution of the lead 207 and 206 systems in comparison to, to each other. There are many minerals that this, this system is used for, but the most common minerals are going to be zircon and monazite. So this concludes our brief discussion on radiogenic and stable isotopes. In the next couple lectures, we're going to be using these systems and these elements to help us better understand how magmas evolve, magmas are generated, and why we think the earth is the way it is. So join us next time for the conclusions of our generation of basaltic magma lecture.